Hey, Unreal Devs, I hope everyone is having a fabulous week. The latest round of free Marketplace content is now available. You have access to an advanced mission and notification system, shaders pack, path follow system, reactive water pack, and a steampunk props pack for this month. Also available are new wood flooring materials, a light profile pack, and a modular sci-fi starter bundle in our permanent collection. Download them all now. With satisfying combat and looting backing up the behemoth hunting gameplay, Dauntless recently launched to incredible success, surpassing 6 million players in its first week. Though Dauntless is Phoenix Lab's first and only title, the roughly 100-person developer boasts talented individuals who hail from AAA companies that include Riot Games, BioWare, Blizzard, and Capcom. We interviewed Phoenix Labs, who talk about creating diverse monsters that would be both fun and challenging to fight, elaborate on how they designed the game's combat system to offer both depth and accessibility, and discuss lessons learned from their thorough playtesting. A feature on the roles of Surface Artists is the latest in our series on jobs in Unreal Engine. With the rapid growth of roles in 3D graphics, Surface Artists have a considerable amount of transferable skills for creative and technical roles in more high-profile organizations. Learn more about what a Surface Artist does, their skill set, and industries they're needed for. Unbound Worlds Apart is a stunning project being brought to life by two-person studio Alien Pixel. Learning Unreal on the fly as they dove into development, the duo leaned on a multitude of resources from Reddit to YouTube to get up to speed on everything the engine has to offer. The result is a hand-painted platformer that cleverly uses portals to bring mind-bending, multi-dimensional puzzles to reality. Read what their lead designer has to say about quitting his day job to commit to Unbound full-time, why Alien fit unique features, and more. Production-ready support for HoloLens 2 will be included in UE423. In the meantime, check out the latest documentation on GitHub. Watch our introductory talk from Microsoft Build to understand common development tasks and download our new Windows Mixed Reality Sample project. Dark Future Blood Red States is an action strategy game that combines explosive carnage with a strategic time dilation mechanic. Set in a dystopian United States, the player controls a group of mercenaries in high-powered cars, wiping out crazed gangs in equally dangerous vehicles. Lead programmer Sam Chester shared his team's solution for creating compelling AI opponents including design decisions, training the AI in formations, and their use of multi-threading and behavior trees. The Unreal Engine community has been experiencing explosive growth throughout Europe as of late, and as a result, we've been expanding our evangelism team to accommodate developer needs. The team continues to grow and is covering more of the vast territories of EMEA than ever before. Find out which evangelist is closest to you and learn about the various conferences, user groups, and amazing Unreal devs they've connected with over the last few months. And now for our top weekly Karma earners, many, many thanks to Every Nun, Nebula Games Inc., Shadow River, Don Buso, P. Dunkel, Norlin, Firefly74, MR, and a North Star. They've helped their fellow devs on Answer Hub. Head on over, answer questions, and you too could see your name up here. Our first spotlight this week is Crystal Command. It's a fast-paced, competitive, third-person action game. Challenge other players in solo or team battles, where you will collect crystals, build armies, and destroy enemy structures. Push your wave of minions down lanes and through enemy defenses to defeat your opponent's Elder God in this intense tug-of-war experience. In Shores Unknown, a single-player tactical RPG, play as the newly made leader of a mercenary company fresh off an assignment gone awry. Now on the wrong side of the crown, allies and loyalty are paramount. Search for truth, explore unknown lands, forge new alliances, and wage battle against those who would see to their end. And lastly, Stay in the Light is an immersive first-person horror game. You are being hunted by him, a creature lurking in a mysterious dungeon. With only a few items, a mirror, a torch, and some chalk, you must survive this hellish place. There are treasures to be found, puzzles to solve, and clues to uncover. It makes use of ray trace reflections and shadows for gameplay mechanics, so you'll need a ray tracing capable card. Thanks for tuning in to this week's Unreal Engine News and Community Spotlight. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Unreal Engine livestream. I'm your host, Victor Broden, and with me today I have 
senior engine evangelist Shorda Jong and senior rendering programmer Juan Kenyatta. And we are here to talk about how to get the most out of ray tracing. And Shorda has done this presentation before, but you have made a couple of updates and changes. And we also brought along Juan to be able to comment uh, with his expertise, since he's actually one of the programmers working on ray tracing in Unreal Engine. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to let everyone know that we are handing out keys to Stay in the Light, which was one of our spotlights earlier. So keep on the lookout for those and try to snag them. They are st Steam keys, so that everyone is aware which, uh, which launcher to put them all in. Without further ado, let's get started. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. It's uh, nice to be back on the stream. Um, so I've done this talk at GDC at the Learning Theater. That was the first version. I updated it for Unreal Fest, which went live. The videos of that went live, about, I think, about two weeks ago. And this is actually V3, so the third version. And plus, we'll have some useful input from Juan on the more technical things yeah. and more perspective on performance. So this whole environment, the subway environment I've built here, is um, primarily focused on the technical part of ray tracing. So really how to get the most out of ray tracing, how to get the most performance out of it, uh, how to look at altering your content slightly different or making some tweaks to it in order to get more performance out of it. So that's very much sort of setup here. Um, so my idea here is that I'm going to go through the, um, the content similar to what I did at GDC, but again in extended fashion. And we'll just have a conversation back and forth about what we're doing, the impact it has on performance, uh, you know, stuff that's up and coming in the future. Any questions you might have, I guess we can take questions we as will they be. come in. So mm -hmm. we'll just go by the flow and talk about it. Good? Good. Yeah. yeah good. Um, so first of all, to enable ray tracing in Unreal Engine 4, you would need to have Windows 18.09, the Windows update. And you would then need to run, you need the latest NVIDIA drivers, obviously, and then you would need to run the editor in DirectX 12 mode. You need to do that with the command line, or you can simply run the project by default using default RHI. You can set it to DirectX 12. Uh, having done that, there's also a setting in here that says um, enable ray tracing. So if you look for ray tracing in the project settings, and I cannot type on this keyboard, so I'm going to make a few mistakes here today. Enable ray tracing, and that's also going to ask you to enable compute skin cache, a second option, and that's it. You're good to go. Um, so I've got my environment here. This is the first level I'm using. It's a, it's a bit more bare bones. There's some lights missing here. But we're going to start off with this, starting off with the lights and the shadows, and then eventually we'll open up the full level and we'll transition into some of the other features, such as uh, aim, aim occlusion, reflections, and so on. But to start with the absolute basics, if you've got a light here, there's a point light here, there's a property in the light called cast ray trace shadows. If you enable that, we get ray trace shadows. So it's that easy. In fact, that property is enabled by default. So by default, you can see these are all pretty much default settings, we'll have ray tracing here. The softness of the ray tracing Excuse my non-technical terms, it's probably correct <laughs> technical correct. terms for yeah. that. But it's set by the attenuation, uh, sorry, the source radius controls that. So if you set the source radius to zero, you get very harshly defined shadows. And as you go up, it gets softer and softer. And that's basically it. Okay, So that's the absolute bare minimum. It works like that. It works similar for other types of lights. So for example, we've got a spotlight here. Same thing. Let me just click that. Spotlight property in here, let me expand this, uh, cost ray trace shadows, enable that, soft shadows there, and we also have the source radius controls it as well. Okay, um, So that's straightforward. Then we've got the rectangular lights. I'll talk a little bit about that. In fact, I can kill this light over here, so we can try this out, and then mm -hmm. it appears that we've removed the modes on the left side, so let me find that back. It's been moved to the right side. Um, but if you act, add a rectangular light to the environment, uh, the rectangular lights were added in, what was it, 4.16, 17, I think? Uh, uh, the the version? Yeah, rectangular? the first time we had rectangular yep, lights. 18, for, I think. For 18, yeah. But the ray tracing support in 4.22. Yeah. yeah. So without ray tracing support, um, the rectangular lights didn't function entirely as they should. I mean, you couldn't get soft shadows in without ray tracing. So that now that ray tracing is in the engine, it means we have proper soft shadows from these rectangular lights. You can control the size of it, obviously, with source width and height. And again, it affects the shadows and how, how sharp the shadow is. 
Um, there's also barn door angle and barn door length, which is an interesting yep. one. So let me set this back to some kind of rectangular size. You can see barn door angle here. If I lower that, how would you best describe this on a technical level, what this does? Well, the barn door tries to mimic uh, cinematographic lights uh, yeah. that create luminaires that are more complex than just a rectangle, but you can crop areas. And that is actually very useful because traditionally in, in games and in real-time graphics, people tend to mimic these kind of lights using a lot of spotlights. And we hear often that ray tracing is slower. But the fact is that sometimes you can achieve the same look, even a better look, with less lights, precisely yeah. because you have yeah. these kind of tools. So mm, that somehow requires to rebuild your assets or maybe rethink on the lighting of your levels. But mm, sometimes you can even save uh, save some render time because you use less lights, mm -hmm. despite those lights are retraced and f might be generally slower. Uh, also, a property in there is a source texture, which I don't think has anything to do with ray tracing itself, correct? I believe that works either way. Yeah, that works either way. Yeah. Um, what the source texture does on a rectangular light is, for example, in, on the tube lights over here on the ceiling, I've made this texture myself. It's not perfect. It's sli actually slightly angled. It's not entirely yep. symmetrical, but it works. Uh, the bright pixels, so the pixels that are not black, will be casting light, and it will also mm -hmm. show up in the reflections. So if I enable this light, you can see you get a more accurate, you know, physically correct representation of the light that's cast to the world because it traces from the texture. Yep. Yeah. And in the reflections also, you can see over there, we can see that texture actually appear in the reflections. So the reflections get more accurate. If I remove this texture, we're simply going to see the rectangular that makes up the rectangular light. Yeah. So also it will get a little bit brighter because it's going to be, you know, some part of the texture is black right now. You can see if I kill that. Besides being brighter, it's also a simple rectangular shape. Yeah. Is that the same as the IAS profile? It's similar in the way that you're using something apart from geometry to drive how mm -hmm. uh, a light works. Uh, the computation internally is a bit different, but yeah, uh, you get idea. You have a light and you don't want to spend time on modeling something more sophisticated, so you use a texture or use a nice profile for mm. determine how to sample with that light. Does both of them work with ray tracing? Yeah, both okay. work with ray tracing, yeah. And when would you want to use one or the other? Mm. Ice profiles are very popular, uh, especially on the architecture space, because there's usually mapping between real luminaires mm -hmm. and ice profiles, and you can just drop them. In your yeah, you can even go to uh, light bulb manufacturers' web pages Correct. and, and yeah. download those. So they ha they're very popular. They have problems too, of course, because you are trying to to mimic uh, a complex luminaire with something that doesn't have any special representation. You're trying to to uh, to convert some data, some table that is usually just one or two dimensions into a, th a luminar three-dimensional three representation and that is a bit inaccurate, especially when you're very close to the light because you might see a very simple geometry like a point light or an area, but you see that the, the shape it creates is very complex, so there is a mismatch. But those ice profiles work great when you are not that close. Okay. They, you don't see the real geometry, but you see the nice effects they, they create. Mm, the texture light uh, works on top of area lights. Most IS profiles work on top of point or spotlights. And the texture light, mm, well, allows you to have more artistic control because you can basically put whatever you want in that texture. Right, you can author it yourself. Yep. It? Yeah, exactly. Yep. But so, it is again, this is not just ray tracing. You could use the source texture also for non-ray trace applications yep, in games. Totally. Yeah, totally. Um, now beyond that, this is an indoor environment. I have a very basic outer environment. Sorry, we're adjusting microphones here. <laughs> is it too loud or too soft? Okay. We're good. Okay, sorry, sorry. we're good. Um, so this is an indoor environment. Obviously, I have a basic outer environment, outdoor scene here. It's essentially a bunch of teapots stick to 
the teapot standard. And I have a directional light somewhere in here, but they basically work the same way. So if you look for um, my directional light, if I even placed it, I didn't place it, so let's place a new one then. Um, here we are. And um, I'll put it to movable. It doesn't really matter, just to get rid of the, uh, the error out in the top left. And again, similar here. There is a property here called uh, use ray trace shadows, which is enabled by default. If you look at the shadows, see there's some difference, and also you have the source angle, I believe, is controlling it over here. Yeah. Yes. Would you ever change the source angle? Sorry? Would you ever change the source angle Re from, from a realistic point of view? Should this ever be changed? Because the sun is basically always, it's a constant. Mm. Well, that's a good question. If you want to be realistic, the the best way to go is to always use area lights, which is what you have in real time, in real life, and mm -hmm. you can and you avoid like using point lights with radius that mm -hmm. can be a virtual radius that it's only used for direct lighting computation, but not for other things. Yeah. So, yeah, if you want to stay realistic, you you just use area lights. Yeah. But when it comes to outdoor lighting, yeah. It's essentially that is yeah. a rectangular light, as a huge rectangular light. Yeah, you, you, we just sampled that as okay. if it was a disk, so it, it's correct under that point yeah. of view. Anyway, so we've got that, we've got the skylight, um, same thing, so it's all pretty straightforward. Yeah. Add that to, enable it. Uh, in this case, it's not enabled by default, so we can enable cost ray to the shadows, and this is mm -hmm. currently rather noisy. Um, what's the status? On yeah, this you or? should see quite remarkable improvements in the next releases in 423 and 424 uh, in expensive ray tracing passes like skylight or uh, ray tracing global illumination we have rewritten the sampling architecture system and we have optimized the denoiser and we have fixed some artifacts uh, so yeah it's a look it oh, look better. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, if needed, you can uh, bump up the samples per pixels. Yep. That would impact performance potentially. So, but it's it's something you can do. Yep. Right. Um, but in any case, let's go back here, and in fact, let's look at the train we've got here. So one thing I, I really like is when the train comes by, and you can see the soft, you know, fading in of, of the light. So if I bring in here's my sequence, here's my train. And it really just shows the, the power of ray tracing. It's nice soft shadows. Right, you can uh, disable this temporarily. Um, ray trace shadows. Remember the commands. It's uh, shadows somewhere in here. Right. I move it out of the way. Sorry. I move it out of the way and put this to zero. So this is without ray tracing, and this is what we're used to in the previous decade. And it's definitely not correct. If I now enable the um, the light on this big large panel, which is a large uh, rectangular light. Let's go here, let's say enabled. We'll get this. Let's put this on uh, lighting only, detail lighting. And this is just, I, I really love doing this every time, because it's just so nice to see. Um, so as the train now drives by, obviously it illuminates the platform, then it darkens it, and then as it moves away again, you get this really soft, nice, gradual fading in. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It cannot be unseen. People mm -hmm. complain to me that I keep saying how cool it is. <laughs> They're getting bored with me. I have a colleague sitting right there. <laughs> <laughs> He's the one of the people doing that. Anyway, you can see it's, it's darkening and then as the train moves away, it's really nice, soft fading in on the light. Yeah. It's really, really nice. So, either way. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I, it's the first time I see that. Okay. Yeah, it's a very nice uh, demonstration, I think of the more subtle payoff of uh, ray tracing. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the performance of light and mm -hmm. shadow, perhaps. Sure. Yeah. Um, in fact, um, Anything you want. I don't have answers for everything. You don't have anything. But I'll try to help. Okay. I think there is one thing. Let me actually maybe delete all the lights here or do something. Let's see. How we best demonstrate this in the easiest way. I think that's a static light. Let's actually just kill the rectangular light we have over here. There's no light outside, so this, I think everything is static now. Let's bring in a new light. 
And you're mixing baked lighting here with a couple of ray trace lights, yeah, right? Yeah, so overall, this is what I'm doing in this particular environment. You see all the lights floating around here, they're all static. So they're not ray traced. Or mm -hmm. in, in essence, they are, I guess, ray traced yeah. in light mess, but it's not the same. They're all static. Mm -hmm. So you can totally do that, and it would help performance, obviously, if you can do part of it baked, part of it dynamic. So in the final scene, what I've done is I took the red light over there, the red light over there, and the red light over there, plus the train light. So those four, those are ray traced. The reflections are ray traced. Aim occlusion is ray traced. Um, but everything else has been baked. Okay. So you can do some kind of hybrids as yep. you see fit. Good. Um, let's go back here. Good. So I think with, when it comes to what I found out when I tested this is if you, and I duplicate a couple of these lights just to make this worse and identify, put everything to movable and everything is ray traced. Performance in general of, of these lights seems to hold up pretty well when it comes to ray trace performance, correct? Mm -hmm. You seem to go, you can go quite far with just ray trace shadows on lights. Um, I agree. Now this computer is rather powerful, so you can see in the frame rate, so we've been trying to slow it down <laughs> so we can more properly show the difference. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to properly do it, but what I've noticed at my own computer is if you go outside the radius of the light, it actually goes up in performance because of the pixels shown that it get impacted by the lights behind us, correct? But that's nothing to do with ray tracing in particular, but I think the impact here might be a bit more pronounced because ray tracing could be more expensive. Yeah, so correct. That's one thing to be aware of. See if I can somehow demonstrate that. It's going to be hard to do on this computer, but you're welcome to try that. Uh, essentially, what happens when these pixels are affected by that light, you need to run a pixel shader operation on these pixels, which makes them slightly more expensive. In that direction, is that correct? To simplify things greatly? Yeah, w w if you're far away from a light, we, yeah. uh, we have some kind of early detection. Mm -hmm. That light is not relevant for ray tracing anymore. Mm -hmm. So you save a lot of the meaty mm -hmm. parts of the ray generation shaders. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's yeah. The, the difference in performance can yeah. be quite big. So one thing you can do, but this is going to affect the realism of the lighting, is you could, of, of course, if you try to shrink the radius of the lights, potentially by changing the light fall off exponent, yep. it's going to be less realistic because light technically travels indefinitely, I think, right? Until it yep. loses its energy. It wouldn't be realistic, but it would help performance considerably. You're, you're very right. Yes. Are there any other things when it comes to light and shadow that people should be aware of in terms of performance? Mm -hmm. Well, in general, area shadows or anything that creates penumbra is slower, yeah. but at the same time, everything looks way better because this is how modes of lighting works in real life. Mm -hmm. um, we keep improving the shadow denoiser. We keep imp we have plans to mm, have more efficient ways of processing several ray tracing lights at the same time, um, denoising several lights at the same time, and yeah, people should expect improvements there. Uh, performance and stability are our main goals for 423. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as you said, Ray tracing shadows and lights are already actually very good in terms of performance, mm -hmm. but Absolutely. it doesn't mean that we we have finished that. We we have plans to to keep working on better special structures for restoring lights to understand which ones are more relevant depending on the mm -hmm. position, depending on the on the power of each light, and depending on f well having smarter heuristics to to reach better render times. In fact, I can demonstrate some of that. So just, I did manage to do this over here. It's rather subtle. It's currently running at 110, 9 milliseconds, something, basically. If you go outside the radius, it goes up to 125 frames per second, eight, yeah. 7 to 8 milliseconds. So just that little difference of doing this. And you can see also source radius, indeed. If the penumbra is zero, it will run better, but you basically lose the yeah. benefits of ray tracing. So it kind of beats the point, but it would run considerably better. This is running at... 82 frames per second, 11 milliseconds. If you bump that up to, say, 0 0.01, it should be dropping, should be a drop just for that small difference already. Yeah. There is a slight drop of about six, seven frames per second just doing that, so yeah. So I did this one little hack that no, I did, and you might not like that. <laughs> um, in fact, I, I have a picture here I'll bring in. But I did a little blueprint setup where over, over a range, get distance too. So the distance between the light and the player, and then you fade the source radius. 
So basically, we set it to zero if it's far away. It's a total hack, I guess. It's a hack, but, but for games when performance yeah. is the number one priority, if that works, yeah. that's why you have blueprints yeah. and all the control so there. Yeah. If someone wants to stay in the correct way, they just yeah. have to avoid yeah. using that, and that's it. Good. Yeah. Cool. So we move to uh, reflections. Okay. Let's uh, open the real level here. So this is the actual level. It's a bit more content here. We move to fences and so on. Um, if you look at the reflections here, there's a mirror. I think this looks awesome. Yep. It's hair sharp. It's really, really nice. Really cool. Yep. Um, of course, you can see there's some black surfaces here. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, the post-process volume, which is hanging in here and floating around here in the middle, has a number of settings here. Are we exposing these further for 423? Are we adding more properties, or what's the current plan? We are improving the reflection mm. system. Our one of the main areas we are working at is um, it's a way to f to use the screen space reflections yeah. when they really work. So we can detect when a shading point is within the camera first term and fall back to ray tracing reflections only when that is really needed. Yeah, because right now, just to show people that. Yeah. That can spin, th spin that, things up a lot. That's why it's black here, because that's the second reflection. So the yeah. secondary reflections are off. If you put it to ah. max bounces two, I that will start that. Yeah. appearing. Yeah. But that's slow, because the frame yeah. rate has gone to 34 frames per second. It used to be 120. Yeah. So. You, I'm afraid you need more bounces mm -hmm. for some cases. Mm -hmm. In other cases, maybe after the first bound, we can, we can fall back to captures or other systems that yeah. are around. That's something we, we can keep exploring. But yeah, generally, increasing the amount of bounces is the the number one topic. But in so four, in four twenty three, we do have the fallback. We oh. have uh, we have changed a few things in oh. the reflections algorithm. I don't I don't recall uh, um, all the details. I know we have vastly improved clear codes, yeah. but they were not properly working on reflections in four twenty two, and I think we are falling back after a certain amount of bounces to into captures. Yep. I'll need yeah. to double check that. I yeah, can yeah. answer offline. But I'm pretty sure. But I believe so, yeah. I, I heard the same thing. So that would mean that the the pixels are black here right now that would fall back to the regular reflection captures. That's an option. I, yeah. yeah. That would uh, be one way of doing it. Yeah. I think it's a yeah, it's in four twenty three. My question is is it's in four twenty two point two maybe there is a hidden C bar that already mm -hmm. allows you to do that. But definitely there is a C bar. Yep. Like our ray tracing dot uh, reflections dot fallback or um, captures or yeah. something that I don't remember exactly which one, but yeah, definitely you yeah. can do that. Comes to the shadows as well. So here we yeah. see the shadows in this mirror over here. Um, it's again controlled by the post process volume, has a number of settings here ray tracing and reflections, shadows, and set to harsh shadow, which is what we're seeing over here. So it yeah. doesn't match the environment. Set it to no shadows or disabled, obviously that's what it implies, yep. or area shadows. This is still rather noisy. Can you give some some background on We're improving the denoiser uh, to make it smarter. Yep. 422 was the first implementation, so there is so much to do. That's why this is early access. Yep. Uh, there are no magic tricks right now to make uh, first reflection bounce cleaner, apart from increasing the amount of yep. bounces. We have to balance be because our denoiser yeah. just works when you have one sample per pixel. So if you increase the amount of bounces, you lose the denoising. Mm. So, and that's something we are working at too. And that's what happens here because it's yeah. the second bounce. Yeah. Oh. So yeah. if you decrease the amount of bounces, it might get a bit cleaner. That's the, my tip. You have to play with that right. because for internal reasons, the denoiser assumes that there is just one sample per pixel. That happens also with other ray tracing passes. And that is something we are working at. If you want to know a little bit more about denoisers, I believe the last time you were here, Juan, we, we did talk a little bit about yep. how denoisers work and um, what they do and what you can expect. That was the uh, post-GDC live stream that we had. I can go ahead and link that in the forum post later. But there's okay. a little bit more information there if you're curious about, um, about that in general. Yep. Mm. Denoisers are part of the magic sauce that make it possible to have real-time yeah. ray tracing now. Um, and we keep improving them. There's 
big improvements in global illumination uh, and in other ray tracing passes too. We are working on making them, oops, it's closing. Mm -hmm. Making them, yeah, this, well, you know. We should cut camera to us <laughs> now at this point. <laughs> uh, we're working on supporting more than one sample per pixel with the denoiser. We are working on making the denoisers aware of w how many bounces there are, because right now, for instance, for reflections, they just assume that you are cleaning the first bounce. But if you have multiple bounces, um, the denoiser doesn't know that yet. So there's plenty of room for improvement. And yeah, we have very bright people working on that space, so uh, we should expect uh, we should expect that things work better and better with its in its update. And we're working on another hotfix for uh, 422. Yep. That should be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, there's a hotfix number three that fixes exactly what happened. Yeah, uh, that's why I wanted uh, to mention it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the thing with ray tracing is that it's built on top of several layers that are completely new, like all the DXR API is new, mm -hmm. the new NVIDIA drivers for ray tracing are new, the huge uh, high-level refactoring we did in our rendering pipeline is also new, and the whole thing is built on top of our DX12 uh, RHI level, which is not new, but it was not the default, the default uh, RHI and Windows. And now people are turning the X12 on because they want to use ray tracing, and we are finding issues that yeah. were already there, but we are finding them now because they, because well, finally people are using the X12, and so yeah, sometimes it looks like with ray tracing things are a bit less stable, but this is because of all these components, and of course ray tracing can have its own bugs, of yeah. course. Um, and we we found a few issues in the NVIDIA drivers, and we found some workarounds and the way they, well, they were allocating resources and destroying them. And we also found a pretty important bug when you lose the focus of your window and you change to other windows, so when you leave it idle for a while, which is what happened now, mm -hmm. um, you have some kind of memory leak. I should move the window here for a moment. Then. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, it doesn't happen always. There's a few conditions, and that fix is part of 4.22.3. It's already in data stream, but data stream will be released, and I think I think it's feature locked or fixes locked next Monday. So it's another week after that. Yeah, so so in a few weeks. You yeah, can stability is our main probably. goal now. Yeah, uh, uh, we from our stats on crashes, we have fixed uh, the causes for the maybe eight or nine of the, of the top ten reasons to have a crash when you have retracing enabled. So we, we are pretty confident we are reaching uh, acceptable levels of stability. And 423 should be more or less at the same stability level that 421 after this bumpy period. Right, because yeah. we did refactor the entire rendering thread. Oh yeah, there were so many changes. Yeah. Yeah, and also dependency on third parties like Microsoft with the mm -hmm. DXR API and, and NVIDIA with the new drivers. It's This is new and known territory for all of us. R we are working together with them, of course. They are helping a lot. Okay. Cool. Good. Um, we'll come back to reflections later. I think there's a lot to say about performance there and, and yep. altering your content for reflections. Let's look at some of the other features before we go there. We got global illumination, so you can enable that in the post-process volume and set the maximum bounces and samples per pixels. I think it's actually a little bit easier to see this one in the uh, this project. Hold on, I'm switching this over. Focus to... That looks pretty scary. That's scary, isn't it? That's very dark. That's very dark. That's a different project I had open. It didn't seem to appreciate that. It's always nice when one thing crashes and the next thing dies. Well, that's how it works. We do it live. It breaks uh -huh. live. Yeah, then uh, uh, take care of that. If you don't mind, I can go ahead and ask ask you a question. Sure. We'll load it up again. Um, is is when is GPU light mass? Um, 
is is it in the works and do, do we have any uh, estimate of when we might release it it is in the works um i don't have an ata yet mm -hmm. it's definitely not 423 nor 424 that's all i can say but well we have people working on that and it's starting to look good so hopefully we can start talking about that in the near future yeah that's okay good. That definitely we we are aware people will will need baking solutions uh, for mm -hmm. quite a while i my background is in film and in offline rendering and i i think in games it will happen as happen in films that people uh, once they fully adopt ray tracing and it gives you the, the performance you need to stop baking because baking has right. a lot of problems but in real time graphics we are still a bit far away from that that will happen for sure. People mm -hmm. will stop using baking, but we know, we know, we need a solution for the next two, three, five years, so people can still bake things. Yeah, I think a lot of level designers and um, lighting artists are excited for the time when there's no no yeah. downtime whatsoever, and you see your results immediately. Yeah, that's that's gonna happen. Yeah, and it's pretty magical that it is already right. Yep. Um, and that we can actually see it and use it. Yep. So. Right, so here we have the Zoyo Berlin flat I took from the marketplace. Um, it's a small environment with a lot of uh, bright surfaces, so it's easier, but easy to show global illumination. And so we've got ray tracing, global illumination, we can enable that, and then this is the impact of that. Um, it's a bit dark, but you can see the difference if I turn it off. Yeah. It does what it implies. You can bump up the bounces, so it's currently set to four bounces, which is not the default, I think the default is simply one. Sample per pixels can be brought up and you will get you will lose some of the yep. the noise but performance also drops considerably but we've changed this quite a bit i think recently yeah usually spec big improvements on rtgi uh, real ray tracing global illumination and 423 uh, it, those artifacts that you saw those splotches were half because you need more samples and half because a uh, few things that we have just improved in the denoiser um, so you 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 will see big improvements there. Global illumination is a big problem. Solving that on real time graphics is uh, this is still an open challenge. Is uh, there's so much to do, but but we are we are happy with where things are going in 423. Um, I don't have like big tips or advice on how to run GI faster, apart from recommending people to upgrade to 423 as soon as possible because improvements are big. Um, be aware, this global illumination just calculates the diffuse part of global illumination. Uh, we are not, yeah, if you have a glossy material, mm. uh, only the diffuse part of that glossy material is, is transported to other parts of the scene uh, because the specular component is calculated in the in the reflections pass. That's something interesting in general. Uh, our hybrid engine, what what it does is to split the rendering equations into little pieces. You have a primary visibility using raster, you have reflections pass, uh, global illumination or emit occlusion, they have to be, they cannot be coexisting because they try to do similar things. Then you have translucency and so on. And then you have to sum all these contributions into something that is consistent and plausible uh, and that is challenging sometimes because maybe you end up double contribution something you mm -hmm. can add the specular component into in from two different passes into the same shading point and that is incorrect or you can um, or you can forget about some in one of them or you can have all kind of uh, of issues so that's it's a pretty sophisticated pipeline it's very different to a path tracer, where you do the whole thing at once. Mm -hmm. There is no double contribution if you don't have bugs, of mm -hmm. course. And there is no like tricky uh, components of the light transport equation, mm, of the rendering equation, mm -hmm. sorry, that you, that you can miss or you can mm -hmm. skip. I see. Cool. Yeah. Um, so back in the other environment, now we've got the uh, aim and occlusion. Mm -hmm. I think we can uh, display this easily here see it's also in the post process volume settings what do i keep forgetting where specifically in occlusion in occlusion right about global illumination oh, yeah, i can't read that's cool um 
and I think there was a second one, right, for ray traced in occlusion we are. So we got those two. Um, what I actually forgot now, and I can ask you while we're here, because I enable it, but I enable it only with the CVAR, correct? There's no checkbox yet. For AO? Yeah, to toggle ray traced AO. Mm, I believe. Yeah, you're I believe correct. It's a, it's a yeah. Setting, yeah. So that would be there is a ray trace in the occlusion setting that you can toggle, which would be that one. Uh, you can see it's currently set to one, so it's currently enabled. So if I set it to zero, we turn it off. Now I bumped up the settings here to rather unrealistic ones, mm -hmm. just to detail lighting or so. But you can kind of see the problem with ray tracing. In fact, if we increase this, that doesn't work. Um, try to really show the problem. This is screen space aim and occlusion right now. Mm -hmm. It's these pipes here, they're floating above in front of the ceiling, and yet the ceiling is darkened. I don't think that's realistic at all. Yeah. It's not what would happen, right? Because it's the screen space effect, so it tries to approximate it, yep. and it makes an error here and there. So if you, by switching to ray trace aim and occlusion, you don't have that impact at all. Yep. This is, this is much more correct, but you still get a darkening where it should occur. Yeah, it's way nicer. Yeah. It yeah. Um, the settings, the normal settings for aim and occlusion also now affect ray tracing. So this intensity, you can see, also affects yeah. the uh, ray trace aim and occlusion now. Yeah, I think so we need to sort out to rearrange the AO parameters mm -hmm. so they are more intuitive. Okay, yeah. maybe there's still time for 423. We'll yeah. see. But are you adding more, are you exposing more of the CVARs to the... I think we need to expose the checkbox, the general okay. one, yeah, like we do check. with reflections. Uh, reflections, if you expand the reflections uh, uh, yeah. system. Yeah, we did that there, yeah. yeah the, the previous one. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that one. Sorry. You have a toggle I, yeah, to say is, if yeah. you want to screen space or not. That should be the right approach yeah. with other parameters too. But in the case of AO, that was a bit trickier mm -hmm. because AO and I mean to and mm -hmm. GI are exclusive, so mm -hmm. uh, we cannot just have one parameter inside the yeah. AU one, but we, n we need it to interrupt with global illumination, so we need to find the best way to do that. We didn't do that for 423 because there is a major mm -hmm. rewrite of some parts of the UI going on, and we want to make it compatible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um. But we are going to spend a lot of time on making things as easy as possible. So Please, sorry, I interrupt you. No, 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 it's fine. We can talk more about performance. Um, so to start with the basics, you can toggle things and tweak the, I mean, uh, the number of bounces, for example, in mm -hmm. post-process volumes. That's the, yep. the easiest, most obvious one. You've got the various CVARs, so if you simply type ray tracing, basically all of this, yep. that you can run through and tweak things with and adjust it and try to optimize it. There's a couple of them here that I've used quite a bit, so we're a couple of obvious ones, I put them in the level blueprints. Um, so if you look over here, there's a few things you can do. Dynamic instancing is off simply because I want to display something later, so ignore yep. that, it has nothing to do with ray tracing. But you can set the reflections max ray distance, which would uh -huh. basically cull the rays at a certain time, yeah. which is slightly faster, I found out. Yeah, it uh, depends on how much you clip, okay. it can be a big improvement. Uh, I gave a talk at GDC mm -hmm. for talking about our demo troll, mm -hmm. and uh, I gave some tips, and most of the tips could be summarized in two ideas. Trace as many rays as possible, yeah. and trace rays that are as short as possible. Yeah. Uh, because, well, if you need to solve something that happens here locally, sometimes something really far away is affecting you. Mm -hmm. That's why, by default, rays don't have an, a maximum distance, yeah. but many times that's not necessary, yes. so you can clip them, and then if this ray uh, escapes from mm -hmm. the scene and it starts traveling mm -hmm. around a forest with lots of mm -hmm. leaves, you, you don't spend time on that. So, yeah. yeah, I recommend you play with the max distance, especially if yeah. you uh, if you are the performance bound yeah. uh, yeah. on the reflection side. Yeah. Same with translucency yeah. and with other things too. You, we have a max ray distance yes. also for for AU and I think that for GI too. Yeah. I think we have yeah. that parameter for everything. We don't expose param some parameters on the UI mm -hmm. because we 
Well, we just exposed the parameters that we are can, kind of sure that they will stay there forever. Yeah. All the parameters that are w too algorithmic, they yeah. prefer them to be hidden. So uh, we give users an idea that, hey, this is kind of experimental. In the future, mm -hmm. maybe you don't need that because maybe mm -hmm. hardware is that fast that mm -hmm. this optimization doesn't make any yeah. sense. Yeah. Uh, so that's one I used to research screen percentage 50 yep. for reflections as well. That's a very good optimization. Yep. If that depending on if you have very mirror-like surfaces and you need mm -hmm. a lot of accuracy or your reflections are kind of blurry, uh, using lower resolution for ray tracing passes is a super straightforward optimization. It's very efficient. I can, in fact, demonstrate that, except I f accidentally deleted my post-process volume. Uh, that's a detail. Um, there's one bug I noticed, though, that's still existing there. It is white low and under certain conditions. Okay. If it's 50. You mean, uh, if this is 50, you mean yeah. something uh, related to uh, reducing the resolution of yeah, the reflection Yeah, if the screen test? percentage is 50. I believe you can only have 50, correct? Yeah, uh, I think we have some restrictions. They are related to the denoiser. Yeah. Uh, I'll need to, I need to recheck that. Yeah. But you can do a quick test disabling the denoiser. Yeah. Um, trying to change the resolution, if it okay. doesn't glow, then it's something that we have to fix in the denoiser. And maybe we have already fixed that for okay. 423. Uh, because it does help performance considerably. Yep. So you can get performance low enough again, because it's the same problem. Let's go to uh, race race reflections, four bounces, create that will do, and then let's put this back at 50, so 40, 38 or so frames per second, and by putting screen percentage to 50, we're all the way up to almost 100 frames per second. Yep. That's a huge increase. Yeah. Apart from, you can obviously, there is a difference in quality. And you get that glow, as you can see. Yep. See, so. You can disable the denoiser to yeah. double check if that is a problem. Okay. You want to try that? You can try, yeah. Improvise on the stream, okay. This uh, <laughs> R. R dot denoiser. R dot shadow. Reflections. R dot R dot reflections dot denoiser. R dot reflection on denoiser. And you can set it to zero and yeah, so it's it's denoiser the related, yeah. It's denoiser related. Yeah, okay. So I'll we need to double check. Maybe it's already fixed. Yeah, I don't okay. know. We have well, the ray tracing yeah. development is just too alive to yeah, yeah, remember yeah. everything okay. we have fixed. But it's a very very good setting for performance once totally. once that is fixed. Yes. Yeah. So that's why it's currently dis disconnected. Mm -hmm. Because of that, but otherwise it would have connected okay. it. Yeah. Um, sort of materials one is a special one. Okay. Um, I'll get back to that in a second. There's a couple of other ones you can use. You can, for example, d disable the height fog specifically on reflections. It doesn't yep. do a huge amount, I think, to performance, but it might as well do that if you don't need it. Yeah, it depends uh, on. Uh, yeah. You save some mathematical operations mm -hmm. uh, on the shader. Mm -hmm. If your bottleneck is there, yeah. you will notice that. Yeah. If your bottleneck is in texture fetching or in yeah. other areas, then then you will not notice that. So again, here same max ray distance. Is there any command, a straightforward command that I missed here, that you feel should be uh, should be present? No, I don't think so. No. I there is also a, a command that I think we introduce in 4.22.2, yeah. which is uh, forced to enable all the ray tracing variables. Uh, I don't know if you know that command. No, I didn't see that, in fact. Yeah, I f yeah, uh, no, let me no force. Here. Okay, it's not there, then it's in, uh, you can type R, yeah. Ray tracing, again? Yeah, ray tracing, dot force. Uh, uh, maybe it's not there. Maybe that yeah, is just 423. Yeah. Okay, it's... Um, so what does it do, then? You can switch on yeah. and off all the ray tracing parameters at once, which is great for performance profiling okay. and for understanding how much it gives to you. So it has three options. It can mm -hmm. you can set it to zero that turns all the ray tracing passes off. Mm -hmm. You can set it to one that mm -hmm. turns everything on, and in cases like AO and GI, right. it turns the expensive one, the one that gives you more visual value. Mm -hmm. uh, or you can set it to minus one, and then it. It's just ignore and it just uses the settings you have in the volume. Okay. Uh, and that's very good to, if you open a new project and you say, okay, how much value ray tracing is going to give me? Mm -hmm. And that is it. Mm -hmm. You can just force it mm -hmm. and you see everything with ray tracing and nice. then you can switch it off again. That's, that's a, cool. That's a nice C bar that yeah. you will have in 423. I thought it was in 422.2, but no, it's not. Yeah. That's okay. It's that's very cool. Yeah. Um, so I made this. Um, 
debug view. And again, it's a bit of a hacky approach, but it's a bit improvised and it kind of does a job. Yep. So I have a boss process blendable here. That mm -hmm. material is currently disabled, so I can enable it. Everything looks like this. Yeah. So what I'm trying to display here, and there's an important lesson in there, is uh, ray tracing is more expensive or less expensive depending on the material settings used. Correct. So the way the materials set up are set up has a major impact on performance when you're using ray tracing. Right? And I try to visualize that here, which pixels and which materials, therefore, are impacting performance more than others. Okay. So green is obviously fast, yellow is medium, red is obviously slow. Mm -hmm. um, it's green here, and this is the interesting part, uh, because if the roughness is over a certain value, we turn off ray trace reflections on those pixels, I believe, correct? And then yeah, there is a parameter to control yes. that. Uh, the idea, and that's a very important optimization, is that when roughness is high enough, rays can bounce in every direction, so everything is kind of blurry. Mm -hmm. So you you can fall back to a cheaper mechanism that just trace rays. Yeah. And you fall back to reflection captures, so you do whatever you want, and you will see just blurry reflections, and you th it's okay if they are not accurate. Yes. That's why it can be very cheap. Yeah. If you have more specular reflections, then this is where yeah. ray tracing g gives you a visual advantage over any other yeah. mechanism. So yeah, th using that parameter can be very important. Would you happen to know what the roughness value is? <coughs> no, it's it's very steam dependent okay. um, because maybe you are super interested in some reflections that are way behind yeah. you and you have a perfect mirror, but the, but maybe the floor is glossy or the mirror is is a bit glossy too, and and it's a bit subjective. So you yes. can you can set yes, in fact, you can set it right there. Yep. Ray trace reflections, max roughness. Perfect. I set it to yep. 0 0.375. I think the default is in fact 0 0.6 or so. I'm going to show you that in just a second. Yep. I just want to stick to this view for one moment more before I go back yep. to the normal view. You can see I intentionally left these pipes red. What you kind of should do is analyze what you have in your environment and then some materials should become more rough or less rough to kind of get uh, the difference between the two greater. Yeah. So you don't want to be in between. The in between point is the uh, the slowest. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because if the if the surface is pure specular with roughness yes. zero, so that's we that's don't the ground here, the puddles. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You can um, calculate in the reflection ray. There is very cheap. Yeah. Uh, because it's, it's just a simple a bounce. Simple and bounce, bounce away, yeah. like it's mathematically described. When you have a glossy surface where roughness is not zero. Mm. You have to use some random yeah. techniques to select an output direction, and that is way more yeah. expensive, not just from the mathematical point of view, but you're introducing noise because uh, each ray does something different. So you mm -hmm. generate variance in mm -hmm. your image that we perceive as noise. Uh, when all the rays do exactly the same, you don't have any variance in the final image. So you and have and something very yeah. So you want to either have so, stuff very reflective, so it can do that, or not reflective at all, so it can fall back to non ray Exactly. The glossy, yes. the mid-range is yeah. where... Is the worst, and that's yeah. what we're trying to identify. So everything red here is mid-range glossiness. Yeah. In fact, um, this is just for reference. Yeah. Sorry, that, that applies to glass, too. If yeah. a glass is pure specular, it's way ch cheaper than if you have a glossy mm -hmm. dielectric, which is a bit far away from real-time graphics now, but it's the same, the same principles apply. Just for the viewers, I want to show this is the material I made. I'm going to go deep into it, but you can probably look at the recording of this and go through it step by step. And again, it's a hack. It's not actually entirely correct, nor is it entirely accurate, but it gives an idea. I have a cutoff point, which is that threshold point you can modify here. I take the, the roughness, scene texture, modify it like this, colored it with an if based on if it's between certain ranges. And that's what we're displaying here. Then I try to, and it didn't work very well at all, so this is pretty much incorrect. But I attempted it. I attempt to do read the world normals, but it doesn't really work well at all. Mm -hmm. The thing is, though, that it's not just the, the, the glossiness. It's also the normal map values, I believe, that has an impact in the same way. And that's what I try to do here. But Yeah, you're right. Anything that uh, makes divergence bigger. A anything that makes the race go in a different direction than exactly. just a simple bounce away, yes. That creates noise. At the end, noise is, is that neighbor pixels right. have very different information. Right because you don't have enough samples, or those samples are very different. And so to be to have this view more correct, what it should have done is also color itself red when the normal map is very strong. When you have very intense normals, it has the same effect. Yeah, correct. Okay, so. In fact, we have not done that optimization mm -hmm. yet, but uh, but we have explored the ability to bias the normal for ray tracing reflections to make it less mm. uh, perturbed. Uh, 
So that's that's something we could do in the future. You, or you can write a blueprint for that. In general, going back to what you said about if I like a hack or not, I'm, I'm totally mm -hmm. okay with hacks mm -hmm. if they are done like in the outer layers of the engine. What we don't want to do is to introduce hacks at the very at core the of core, the rate yes. tracer. Yeah, but if someone wants to use blueprints for a hack or yeah. any uh, anything that is not affecting the core, then it's I'm yeah. completely fine with that. That's exactly the, the place where hacks have to yeah. happen. Yeah. So also, just to go back then to, m to max roughness, now we're in the normal view again. You can see it's 30 FPS, roughly. Right, if I reset this to the default, of, I think 0 0.6 is now 27 frames per second, mm -hmm. 35, 36 milliseconds, right? So if you bring this down to 0 0.15, say, you get 30. 34 frames per second, 28 milliseconds. So yes. you, there's a difference in impact in performance. So yep. what I did here, and what I would advise everyone, is to tweak this number to the lowest possible number you can get without that it visually looks too different. Yep. And that's the number you're going to settle at. Because the default of 0 0.6 is much higher, I think, than you usually need. Like typically, I mean, around 0 0.5, you wouldn't even notice it anymore. 0 0.4, you don't necessarily notice. So 0 0.375 is what I have. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, let's look at our notes to see what we forgot to mention here, possibly. Oh, the rate coherency in general, so because that brings us to the interesting next question, right? At least for me, because when I did the GDC learning theater talk, I talked about it. I talked about how very reflective surfaces are faster because you can do an easy calculation bouncing the ray. But then... Um, I look deeper into this and you know, try to understand why is that why is that really really slower than what's the impact it has and so I ended up with ray coherency yeah. so how coherent are the rays if the rays hit the puddle here on the ground how coherent do they you know bounce away in the same direction yep. if it's a very rough surface they're not going to be coherent they're going to go in different directions right and the impact Correct. it has on performance and so from what I was told and from what I understand is um, and I might incorrectly compare this to render states without ray tracing, but when the, the rays hit a surface, so they hit something, they bounce, and they hit something else far away wherever they're going. If that is a different shader than another ray, that gets slightly slower. It likes to batch, this, batch them together, and it likes to hit the same shaders. Yeah, correct. correct. So uh, what happens is that GPUs are very fast when all the small GPU cores mm -hmm. do pretty much the same. And they can be very slow if they have to do things that are very different. So it applies to ray tracing in, in exactly the way you describe. If you have a lot of camera rays uh, and they all hit the same object, mm -hmm. uh, they will do very similar things because that object has and one material applied and that will be much faster. What happens with the second bounce mm -hmm. is that yeah. in general you have much more divergence than in the, the first camera yeah. ray, which, by the way, we don't trace camera yeah. rays in the hybrid engine, only in the path tracer, but anyway, that was mm -hmm. just for explaining what you just said. So the secondary, the, and mm -hmm. after the first bounce, each ray hits some different material. And it gets If you have a, a rich scene. So what we do is to sort those rays per material. Mm -hmm. So and then we evaluate them per material, so you have um, that material, like in what mm -hmm. we call in cache or hot, and that is way better for the yeah. for the for a GPU in general. But maybe in a different scene, sorting by material is not the best strategy. You want to sort mm -hmm. by object, the object mm -hmm. you impact, mm -hmm. or maybe you want to sort by direction, mm -hmm. or you can to sort by. Um, shader points that are closer, especially mm -hmm. closer. So there, there are many ways to sort things. The main idea is to try to give uh, the GPU things, to send to the GPU things in a way that that it can maximize yeah. its strength, with is, which is that let's calculate uh, lots of things that are very similar. Right. So I build a small test case here. It doesn't always seem to give me entirely um, you know, similar results. So mm -hmm. it goes up and down a little bit. You can see the frame rate here. So what I have is a whole bunch of boxes yep. um, placed with a blueprint, generated with a blueprint. Each of those boxes has different material. Okay, so it's a different material, right? It's not yeah, just it's an actual different material. Very simple material, but an actual mm -hmm. different material with medium roughness and some form of normal map there. So it's kind of simplified normal yeah. worst case scenario. Um, reflective teapot in the middle and a single light casting ray traced shadows. And so it's about performance of that. Because here the ray coherency is very low because it's going to hit this, yep. or it hits the surfaces here as well. It goes in different directions because it's medium, rough, and the normal map, and then it hits different shaders pretty much all the time. You're correct. So, so that was more or less a test. And then to compare that, 
because I have a setting in, this is a blueprint, so the whole walls are a blueprint, I made a setting for use instances. So it does the same thing, but then it uses a single material with instances coming from that. So it's a single shader and a difference on performance that that makes. Now again, it doesn't always show very clearly, but in this case actually it's working, because right now, make sure you can see the frame, the, um, frame rate in milliseconds, so it's about 10 to 11-ish milliseconds, about 90, what is 90, 90 something frames per mm -hmm. second. If you turn off instances again, this drops to 78 frames per second, about 12 milliseconds. So that's yeah. the difference there with ray coherency. Yeah. If you use a single material, so everything is just the same, it does exactly the same. You can see this is to about, do about the same, about 90 something. If I go for instances instead, it's about the same performance because mm -hmm. it's the same shader. Um, and then you have that sort material setting indeed. That's the one we also briefly yeah, touched on That's earlier. the one I was yeah. talking about. Yeah. So in fact, let me turn off instance again. So we go back to the worst case scenario. And, um, sorry, let me get rid of this for a second. So we're at, again, 70 something, 80, early 80s, I think it's running in. So sort materials, it's called. Ray yeah. tracing, reflection, sort materials. It's an optimization technique that tries to batch the rays together or sort sort them together, right? That is currently set to zero, so it's disabled. If I enable that, and this is why it's a setting, right? It's sometimes going to be better, sometimes it's not. Yeah. Right, so uh, I enable that. In this case, I'm not sure if it did actually do much here. Any immediate impact? You've got to try this case by yeah. case. It doesn't seem to do much at all in this case. Mm. It might be that, because the, the editor crashed earlier, and this is the reason why I disabled the dynamic batching, that there's an impact of this as well. So just to make sure I'm going to disable the dynamic batching again and then just verify. Yeah, maybe that's affecting. Uh, also, what's the roughness of the teapot? Uh, the the teapot is 100% uh, zero, I mean. OK, so uh, pure mirror. Yeah, pure mirror. But um, everything the roughness else. of the well, these surfaces is 0 0.6 or something. I, okay. think I, I can double check in a second. Uh, so this yeah, you can also check what's the threshold, the roughness threshold for that material to see if this is really computing. I believe it. It should, yeah. yeah. So but it should, yeah. Just double check now. Maybe. Yeah, so in this case, there's not much impact, but you can, in any case, use yeah. this setting, check what it does for you. Does it better? Is it worse? Yeah. And then base yourself on that. It can save a lot of time, but yeah. at the same time, you have to spend time on sorting those rays. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so it's... Uh, it's a, yeah. it's a balance. It's uh, a balance. We, those plans that I was talking about of mixing screen space reflections and ray tracing reflections rely on this system. So we are improving right. that right now. And you might see improvements in 423 as well. Right. Um, let me reset the max bounces back to one. But to go back to that ray coherency top topic within an environment like this, though, um, what I didn't do correctly in retrospect now, what would have probably been faster, is either the surfaces are very reflective, so the ray coherency is the same because they all bounce in the same way, or you would have to make sure that there aren't too many shader permutations in the environment, so yeah. that even if the rays are not bouncing in the same direction, they're going in all kinds of different directions, they're still going to hit similar shaders everywhere they go. That would render faster, yeah. correct? And I, d we, I didn't do this at all. I used existing content here. There's a lot of different materials here, how this is content is set up. If this would have been done with more you know, master materials and a couple of material instances with as little shade and permutations on that as possible, that would have actually rendered faster. Yeah. And that would be an important optimization technique, yeah. I would say. They were wondering where the scene was from. It's a Decagon asset pack, right? Um, the train and the tunnel, and therefore the rails, they are indeed his. But the station itself is based on the original, what is it, 2015 or something, sequencer, and Martin A back then um, sample we have on the launcher. Okay, and it's on and the launcher. And then I recolored it, so it's a bit more you know colorful. And I built this myself from scratch, but I mean it's just circular mirror things. It's easy. And some of this stuff, if you want the details, if you want the full story, <laughs> some of these things and these meshes here, uh, they come from the infiltrator demo. And that's mm -hmm. it. That's yep. all the content. It's a bit of a kit batch between. That's kit batch. Yeah. 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 Good. Um, looking through our notes to see what we have to mention here. So we did sort materials. Yep. Um, material complexity, actually, is an interesting mm -hmm. one. Yeah, that's... Um, so from what I was told, the material complexity has a bigger impact in ray tracing than otherwise because of reflections. Yep, yep. correct. If, if you don't need to 
evaluate a very complex material in a reflection, we provide these nodes. Yes, the fallback. Yeah, that allows you to simplify that. Yeah. Let's imagine a very extreme case where you have multiple reflections and you start losing energy. At the very end, it really doesn't care if your texture is blurred or mm -hmm. not, or if even if you have a flat color mm -hmm. instead of a texture. You e evaluating um, a very expensive material yeah. after the first bond or the second one will only make sense for yeah. for some cases where your surfaces are very close to mirrors. If yeah. your surface is a bit glossy, you can start yeah. cheating things. In fact, there's more optimizations related to this one in 423, like uh, like we, depending on the roughness of your surfaces, we mm. can clamp rays quickly uh, instead of having lots of bounces because of kind of the same principle that you you don't need a lot of accuracy after two or three yeah. bounces because yeah. of all the energy loss, you can survive with a simpler material. So that idea can be extended yeah. to any ray tracing pass and you say, okay, I... I, I don't need something in the big. Imagine an RTGI, you're bouncing in a diffuse surface, and then you're bouncing in another one, and, well, you're trying to compute, like, mm -hmm. subtle color bleeding. Mm -hmm. You don't need to spend a lot of time on that shading point evaluating a crazy material mm -hmm. uh, network with lots of um, textures, uh, mm -hmm. high-resolution textures mm -hmm. and so on. Maybe just a flat mm -hmm. color works. Okay. But so, yeah, the impact of materials is great, and that's... Uh, it can be great can be if great, your yeah. materials are very expensive. Yeah, so the impact of expensive materials is greater yeah. in... For simple materials, there's no yeah. uh, no difference. And, but yeah. and so to go to that thing you mentioned, I have a material instance here, which this is the bench, so the bench over there. Yeah. Um, and in that instance, I can show you the material in a second, but it just says use um, red reflection yeah. parameter. So if I apply that instance to the bench, what happens is this looks exactly the same, right? But in the reflection, it's now red. Mm. So that's that yeah. feature in in action. Obviously, you probably wouldn't want to make it red, <laughs> um, you know, in, in a game or other application. Yeah. But just to show you how the feature works, and so the material here is made like so. I'll bring that up. Um, you can see there's this uh, ray tracing quality switch replace, yeah. and if ray trace, you can say use this instead. So use red. Yeah. And so this is a bit of a simplistic example. Yeah. But for example here. Say in ray tracing, you wouldn't be able to see this, then don't use it. Yeah. Then block it out. And that's what we did here. We blocked it out. Yeah. And that's maybe it. that quality switch, we should remove the word quality from mm -hmm. there. Maybe you want to do that also for artistic purposes. Maybe. Also, yes. Yeah. So yeah. it's basically a ray tracing yeah. material switch. But so, you know, and I think the impact of materials is, is really important for content oh developers. Yeah. There's those two key points, right? You want to use as many, as few different shaders as possible. That's step one and you want to cut down on material complexity, either yeah. using this uh, switch replace or just in general. Yeah, material I think those complexity are two really important things yeah. that people need to, and also work with the uh, roughness and normal map amounts. Yeah. So those are important things that, that should be tweaked on a, you know actual content basis. Yep. Yeah. Um, mass materials are slower. They are, because you need to Evaluate the texture yeah. and shadow rays and other ray tracing effects, and it's not enough to try to sample a light and say, okay, there is an occluder in the middle, mm -hmm. but you have to evaluate the material of that occluder and you have to see if it has an alpha texture and you have to see if you have a right. zero or a one value there, and that is yeah. way more expensive. That's the reason. Yeah. It was masked materials. I thought you said master materials. No, so uh, no, mask, 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 yeah. mask, 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 yeah. English. Um, <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. Um, but there were some improvements coming in 423 or slight. I mean, it remains a challenge, but... It remains a challenge. Uh, there are some improvements here. There's improvements in general in sampling, yeah. so that will affect mask materials. Uh, but there is nothing super relevant that is yeah. going to be like a life changer yet. Well, we have some ideas on, on that. Yeah. 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 We have fixed some artifacts that happened when you had... Um, Double side materials and yeah. materials that we're facing for yeah. to the other side. Yeah. Okay. I understood that any geometry with small holes or spaces is also typically slower, because as the rays go through the geometry, you have to consider nearby geometry, which is more likely to happen yeah. if it's small holes and spaces. Yeah. Well, in general, yeah, you're, you're right. Yeah. If 
the more complex your geometry is, the more complex the acceleration structure is, that and too. then ray navigation is it's also more complex. The nice thing of ray tracing ac acceleration structures like the BBH is that they they don't sc the render time or the navigation time doesn't scale linearly with mm -hmm. the amount of geometry mm -hmm. like happens in raster. So if you have a massive world let's say with a couple of billion polygons uh, and then you multiply the size by 10 mm -hmm. the navigation time doesn't mm. doesn't multiply by 10 mm. because then there's a, the navigation time scales with the logarithmic okay. uh, it's not linear it's logarithmic so so ray tracing should be kind of not very sensible uh, yeah. uh, in terms of the amount of geometry but of course if the geometry is very complex you will spend more time navigating that's for sure. Yeah. But does the problem get worse, the challenge get worse if it's a lot of, I mean, you can have, for example, high poly complex geometry that is spread out or, you know, smooth shapes or something like that, VS, spending those polygons in lots of small little holes and spaces. Yeah. That it would be worse, I assume, than. In general, when you have a lot of intersects in yeah. geometry and in the same uh, voxel or in the same acceleration structure, you have a lot of things happening. That's way slower in yeah. general. Okay. Yeah. That's an open. Another open problem in yeah. real-time ray tracing. Okay. Yeah. So you could, if you want to create and simplify it, you could say that architectural buildings are typically fast. Yeah, if they're like square, yeah, they're those, square those walls is great. So Definitely, okay. they are faster than trees. Trees, trees. are horrible. Trees okay. with, with. Uh, also, if you have wind, that that can be even worse. I mean, we, in four twenty three, we will support landscape. Yeah. Uh, and we also support instances and hierarchical instances we don't support yet word position offset yeah um except for landscape that we can do something separated yeah. uh, so we support word position offset for landscape but yeah the, the problem of having a tree where mm -hmm. the the leaves move with the wind because they have a word position mm -hmm. offset parameter in the material that's a very hard problem for yeah. ray tracing because well all the material logic that moves vertex mm -hmm. on the vertex shader it's very unfriendly for the ray tracer because mm -hmm. the ray tracer needs the geometry, like fixed geometry that you can put in the acceleration structure as soon as possible. But well, uh, what precision offset and other similar techniques, what they do is that they, you have some static geometry mm. and you move the vertex. Mm. The vertex is at the very end of the rendering pipeline. Mm. So we are working on, well, on a mechanism so we can understand how vertices are going to move and so we can fit the acceleration structure to to have the same effect in ray tracing and that's a hard problem to yeah. solve that's one of the things we want to to work at in the next few months right. okay but so foliage in general yeah it's i mean it's moss materials it th might be high poly with a lot of small spaces in it and yeah. then the world position offset that's so it's, it's three things in a row yeah uh, if, if you ask me what is the biggest problem in ray tracing for for games or yeah. for that space, yeah, it's it's a forest okay. full of leaves that are moved yeah. by the wind. Yeah. From the l th from the navigation side, that's yeah. definitely the worst problem. Uh, from the light transport side, everything that has a lot of glass and mm -hmm. global illumination behind the glass. Every time you put a glass between you and mm -hmm. and your objects. Mm -hmm you're introducing a lot of complexity because effectively you are converting all the lighting into indirect lighting. Yeah. So those two problems are, yeah. are, are challenges that we'll try to face in the next yeah. few years. Because if you go back to the other tier for a second, there is um, uh, ray trace translucency. Mm -hmm. So we can set this in the uh, post-process volume again. Yeah. It says here somewhere. Um, I think ray tracing, tr translucency first, you set the type roster to ray tracing. Yeah. Got to hold on. I got to bring in the train because the train has glass. Uh, train is on its way. That will do. Um, let's see where was I? Right. You can set this from raster to ray tracing. Let me look at the mirror here. And this is obviously not ray trace right now. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's very clearly screen space reflections. Yeah. As you can see, I'm doing that. Um, so ray tracing. I get this. Nice. Yeah. So it's not quite there yet. Yeah. In this particular one, I mean, it's a single bounce only. As you, you can, can increase the number of bounces and translucency, but yeah, there's much 
more to do. Translucency yeah. is one of our main goals for the next few months too. Yeah. Because as I said, uh, you can have a very nice reflection pass with yeah. a denoiser that assumes that you have a reflection, a reflection bounce mm -hmm. and, and the denoiser understand that, and whatever, mm -hmm. but then you have a glass in the middle mm -hmm. and reflections at the other side mm -hmm. of that glass, they cannot go through the same logic that uh, for the denoiser and for other mm -hmm. things that we do that if you don't have the glass. Mm -hmm. So it's like another world. And if mm. instead of one glass you have two, or you have yeah. reflections and shadows in reflections, yeah. or shadows behind a glass, you have all these kind of it's problems. Really complex, that yeah. Well, effectively, the only way to fix them all in the long term is having real-time path tracing. Yeah. Uh, but we have to wait a few more years until that happens. Yeah. There yeah. are some games that claim to have some kind of real-time path tracing. Yeah, it's true that under mm -hmm. uh, constrained environments, you can you can mm -hmm. have really really good uh, render times with path tracing, but in yeah. the general case that yeah. an unreal yeah. uh, UE4 user needs, yeah. we, we're still a bit far away from that, so we need to work on all these improvements for making translucency yeah. as powerful as possible. Yeah. Chat was wondering if mm -hmm. uh, translucent particles will be working with ray tracing in 4.23. Uh, what we did with Troll was that we wanted translucency on the water, ray tracing translucency, but we didn't want ray tracing translucency on the particles of the fairies because, well, you can spend a lot of time on something that is not giving you a lot of value in comparison mm -hmm. with ray tracing. So we designed a system for both to interrupt and we, we are, our plan is to keep growing on that. Uh, so there are no big changes yet on, on that, but they w things will look way better in the next couple of months. So okay. not sure if for 423. But so what you want to do is be able to set up thermal material in a set up per material, help, yeah. yeah, or having a separate translucency mode yeah. when you want, yeah, exactly. Th that yeah. would be per material, yep. yeah, yeah. But so you could generalize it and say that translucency is the hardest problem in ray tracing and the one that maybe takes the longest to get right? Uh, yeah, I don't know For if there is a ranking. I mean, the you're without ranking it, but just in general, it is it's it's a challenge, yeah. Uh, yeah. Even in offline rendering, the hardest problems were always they always involve glass. Yeah. Uh, you have glass and you have caustics behind a glass, or you have glass and you have all kind of interreflections behind a glass. Mm -hmm. The same maps mm -hmm. to real-time graphics in real time. Yeah, when you have a glass, this is bad mm -hmm. news in general yeah. for performance. So yeah, that's that's a big problem. Not just the glass itself, but the in how all the ray tracing mm -hmm. effects interrupt mm -hmm. with the glass. Uh, okay, what mm -hmm. happens with my GI behind a glass? Mm -hmm. Well. What happens is uh, that you need a lot of bounces to mm -hmm. solve that. Mm -hmm. Yep. But we talked a little bit about the acceleration structure. Yep. What actually is that for everyone? Okay. Well, that is that if if you have a very naive ray yeah. tracing system, you trace a rays. Yeah. For, for instance, from the camera, um, UV4 is different, but let's tr you mm -hmm. trace a ray from the camera, and you have to evaluate if you are intersecting all the triangles mm -hmm. of your mm -hmm. scene. That is super costly, yeah. and so you need a system yeah. to check right. intersections yeah. only when th with things that are near your ray, nearby. Yeah. Uh, nearby. So you you split the space into parts. It's so you like say a bounding okay. box. Exactly. It's yeah. like a, there are many different yeah. acceleration structures. Uh, the one we use is a BBH, a bounding yeah. volume hierarchy. Yeah. So you have like a hierarchy of bounding boxes. There's there are other very popular acceleration structures mm -hmm. like key. KD3s or things like that. So, but basically, all of them try to minimize the amount of intersection tests that you yeah. do with your ray. That's that's the key. Um, some of them uh, accelerate the navigation a lot, mm -hmm. but but they are very expensive to build. Mm -hmm. um, in real time ray tracing, you need something that is fast to build mm -hmm. or fast to mm -hmm. update. So mm -hmm. when you have a character that mm -hmm. is moving, you. Mm -hmm. You have a you don't have to rewrite the whole BBH from the scratch, so yeah, that's uh, there is a lot of high tech right. involved on on that. But do you build it per model or is it per group of polygons? I mean, uh, well, with DXR, mm -hmm. that's responsibility of the driver. Okay, so it's like a black box, and we don't okay. care. But we. You can you can have different BBH per object, yeah. and then you have like a top level BBH. So that's that's the c most common approach okay. these days. You have a bottom level BBH, one per object or one per whatever you want. You can 
you have control over yeah. that. That can be a cluster of triangles, yeah. or can be a lot of them, or you can yeah. merge several geometries yeah. into just one. Yeah. And then you have a top-level BBH that you uh, that is way faster to yeah. build. But so my understanding from is that the biggest impact this has on on developers and and content creators is that it takes memory to store the acceleration structure. Yeah, it takes memory yeah. and it's it can be slow to construct if you have a lot of objects yeah. moving. Uh, so okay. it can be memory and speed. But so the, the higher polygon, the the bigger the memory take. Mm, the I understood uh, correct or kind of well if you. Do if all your polygons are big, uh, at the end, what takes memory is how many times you have to split your yeah, space. Yeah, yeah. So, if you just have one big polygon, you don't need to do a lot of splits. Yeah. But uh, splits will depend on how many polygons you yeah. have. And it's true that if in the middle of all your small polygons you have other big triangles, yeah. that really screws your yeah. BBH up. Yeah, definitely. The, the quality of your mesh can really affect how the acceleration structure is constructed. So does that mean having long, long, thin triangles is, is worse in that sense? Or that can affect, the, the, uh, as I said, we don't build the acceleration yeah. structure that is part of the yeah. driver now. So I don't know all the details, uh -huh. but that can really yeah. definitely affect your, the quality uh, of your and, and acceleration structure and that will affect okay. the navigation. And then yeah. from what I understand, this is the most important part perhaps, is that if it's a dynamic mesh or a skinned dynamic mesh or character, yeah. you can't cache that. So you've got to rerun this all the time. Yeah, you have to so update that. So yeah. the, the magic is to try to minimize the amount of things you update. And that takes more memory. That takes considerable amount of memory, I, I believe. Well, yeah, you have your character that has yeah. a million polys, yeah. and the following frame, yeah. you have to update that million Again, polys. Yeah. yeah, maybe you need more memory for intermediate structures and whatever, yeah. but the, the main bottleneck there is performance. How do you put yeah. more... Uh, how do you update all those vertices uh, in but real time? But could we completely generalize this and say that if you're using ray tracing, you're more likely to hit some kind of challenge if you have a lot of characters or similar mesh, similar things like characters that are very high poly in screen at the same time. It's more sensitive to that. You can, yeah, you can hit a bottleneck there yeah. because you need a lot of time to feed mm -hmm. uh, to update the acceleration structures. Yeah. On the other hand, once the acceleration structures are built, ray navigation, uh, as I said, is logarithmic, so it can mm -hmm. it can be very fast. And in very very large scenes, mm. ray tracing is typically more powerful than yeah. raster. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I had this one interesting picture. I can just quickly throw in there. Nothing to do with the acceleration structure, yeah. but just to, uh, just to illustrate what ray tracing could do. It's a, a bunch of T-pots. There are about mm -hmm. 100,000 triangles per T-pot. Same number of them, same view. One is uh, cascade shadow maps, the other one is ray traced. And it's going to be impossible to read even for me, but if you try zooming in here, if I zoom in. Right, so cascade shadow maps, 52 frames per second, 18 milliseconds. Yep. The other one, 13 milliseconds, 73 frames yeah. per second. We have seen that pattern yeah. uh, common, uh, uh, often. Mm -hmm. like, um, Ray tracing shadows being faster than raster shadows. That can happen. Under conditions, yeah. For example, with high poly yeah. content, which I exactly. believe yeah. cascaded shadow maps is particularly sensitive to. Yeah. And you don't have a range on the ray trace shadows. So you don't have this fading of shadows that you yeah. have with cascaded shadow maps. No, you just you get don't shadows all the way through. Yeah. That's very, very nice. Yeah, and the code is m way cleaner. Yeah. And uh, yes, shadows is one of the places where ray tracing really shines, yeah. not just for users, but also mm -hmm. For developers, like okay, mm -hmm. my code is cleaner. I don't need a thousand hacks and uh, different approaches yeah. for fixing all the problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. We're getting close to yeah. having okay. to run out the stream, yeah. but I wanted to go through some of the questions. Yes. So sure, of course. Um, are, is this a good good time, or yeah, do you have some more stuff? Yeah. All right, okay. Um, so th they were wondering um, if ray tracing works on non-realistic games, and it, it totally does, right? There, there's sure. nothing stopping you from using it. It's more an artistic. Yep. Um, an artistic choice, right? If you want to use it, totally. At the end, realism uh, depends more on on materials, on the material model, on the camera model, on the sky model. So nothing prevents you to create your own BRDF models or edit the ones we have through blueprints to achieve things that are not plausible, but maybe mm -hmm. they are what mm -hmm. exactly what you're looking for. And I've already seen a couple examples of non-realistic games out there that have enabled. Yeah. Um, Ray tracing, so it totally works. Um, 
Is there still room for growth in performance with ray tracing on the software side, or is performance going to be hard capped by, by the limitations of hardware? Both. We are already improving performance on 4.23, and we will keep doing that in 4.24. Uh, there's so much work we can do on sampling techniques, on denoiser, and, and having better algorithms for complex situations mm -hmm. like the ones I was describing with translucency. And at the same time, other problems will be solved when we have faster hardware, so both. And to give a bit of perspective, how long have we been doing rasterized? Um, yeah, 20, 30 years. Yeah, and how long have we been doing ray tracing? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, here at Epic, one year, we uh -huh. started working on ray tracing and the hybrid engine literally a year ago. Uh, we've been working on ray tracing for maybe 10, 15 years, but offline ray tracing. Correct, has different not in real time, yeah. Oh, yeah, re real time ray tracing is a very Complete new Complete different scenario, yeah. yeah. Um, so this user is trying to do ray traced lens distortion. How do we modify the generated ray directions? Uh, that's interesting. Uh, if the thing is that the hybrid render uses the G buffer, I mean, uses the raster primary visibility, so it doesn't trace camera rays, but you just trace reflection rays or global illumination or whatever. But the first you you have your primary visibility, so you cannot affect the the lens with the hybrid engine as it is now. You will need to create your own ray generation shader uh, with your lens model, then you can do whatever you want. You can use any kind of projection matrix uh, for tracing rays. But in that case, you cannot use the G buffer anymore because the, the raster engine will not use that projection. Uh, I don't know if I'm getting too technical. But the, the other option is to use our path tracer. Our path tracer really traces camera rays, so you can change the camera code, the camera sampling system, which is a small uh, routine, it's not a lot of code, and you can replace it with whatever you want. You can have a spherical lens, you can have fish lens, you can have a uh, non-linear lens, you can do stereo rendering, you can do whatever. So, yeah, they, ca they can do that. I recommend them to use, uh, to take a look into our path tracer code, or our, even our ray tracing the back view modes, they also trace primary rays, and they can experiment with that. Okay, nice. Um, can you dynamically change ray bounce count when moving from one area to another? Well, with, so. with volumes, right? Right, yeah, this is to post process yeah. volumes, yeah. yeah. But so e even with uh, blueprint and uh, you know, execute console commands. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Yep. Yeah. You oh, can do so you that's can very useful. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't need other bounces if, if you're outdoor and then you enter in your super clean bathroom and you will mm -hmm. need yeah. that. Um, let's see, are, are we going to support ray traced foliage in 4.23? We are going to support that. Uh, we Because foliage is hierarchical instances and we will support hierarchical instances and regular instances in 4.23 and landscape. What we are not going to support yet is world position offset and people use world position offset for simulating wind. Yeah. As I said, uh, that's an open problem, but that is something we are working at right mm -hmm. now. And as soon as we can, we will push that code into the rendering. I, if this is after 4.23, <coughs> then well, maybe we, I don't think they will allow me to put that in a hotfix <laughs> because this is probably too big for a hotfix. Yeah. But, well, that code will be in the rendering and people who are really impatient to get it, they could compile from the sources and otherwise wait for 424. But this is pure research. I'm not committing myself mm -hmm. to have this done <laughs> on a specific date. I just, I'm just confident that we will come out with a good solution, at least for a reasonable amount of uh, leaves. If you have like two billion trees, with, uh, then I don't know how this is going to work. Let's go step by step. Um, and they were also wondering if there was a specific roadmap for the upcoming supported feature list uh, for ray tracing. And I believe we, we would just direct to the uh, the regular public roadmap. Yeah, I'd in our GDC talk, the last or the second to last slide was a, a roadmap. Mm, okay. This is more or less what we can say at this point. W I think we have already kind of mentioned what we're doing in yeah. the future, some multi-GPU support, translucency, work position offset, landscape, uh, the GPU light mass. Um, we have already mentioned pretty much um, a lot of the things we, c we, we can talk about at this point. That's good. Um, 
I am using ray tracing with a GTX 1070 and performance is very good. Am I doing something wrong or is RTX just not that important? <laughs> it's a simple scene. Uh, that's a question for me. I don't, I don't want to get into details for if what are the difference, but the it's very scene dependent. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, definitely that hardware can give you a lot of perf if you, if you apply source tips for optimizing things, then you can have a very cool performance. Of course, a 2080 Ti will give you more race per second. But yes. To probably he's not doing anything wrong. He's doing things right. <laughs> That's good. Um, are ray traced refractions working at the moment? Well, they are. They are slow. So I said, maybe you need to to push them, the amount of bounces to have something realistic. They don't match raster refractions because the way ray tracing works is more accurate, but it, we, we cannot mimic something that is a fake. So they, are, they will look different. They shouldn't expect the same result when you have raster or ray tracing translucency. But as, as you pointed out, it's not enabled by default. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe this person is expecting um, that it works out of the box like reflections or AO, but you have to enable that in the volume or using a C bar. Nice. Um, any news about voxel global um, illumination? Is it still a thing or is it dead since ray tracing came in? We are working on non-ray tracing lighting issues too. Uh, global illumination is one of the big open problems yeah. in real-time graphics and we are exploring on techniques on their space. They are not necessarily based on voxel, on cone voxel approaches, but we could use them. That's all I can say. You know, I don't want to talk about things that are, I'm not leading those initiatives. Yeah, no, you, you I don't, don't want to anyone to kill I'm going to show you all the questions and then you yeah. can say yeah or nay. Um, will the particles editor, editor, and I believe they are referring to Cascade, uh, fully support ray tracing or uh, will we need to migrate to Niagara? Uh, we recommend to migrate to Niagara, to Niagara in general. Yeah. Uh, we even have that internal fight with Fortnite folks too. Mm -hmm. Like they, they're migrating to Niagara. It's not just a ray tracing thing. It's an entirely new, way more powerful, cleaner system. So we didn't feel that with something that new like ray tracing, we had to spend time on a system that we consider mm -hmm. obsolete because there is something better. So uh, yeah, I'm sorry. The answer is that so far we are going to be focused on Niagara. Can ray tracing be expected to work in VR? Yeah, it can. Uh, that's a stretch goal for 423. Okay. Hopefully, but we have some problems with the denoisers that assume that you just that you just have one view mm -hmm. that we need to to fix, and that is one of the things we'll try to work on this month. It's probably getting a bit too late for 423, but I have not lost hope yet. Okay. Uh, otherwise, it will be 424, and as I said, that code will be in the rendering, so anyone who feels like that can compile from the sources, they can, they can do that, or they can apply that fix into 423, but maybe it will be in 423. Okay, we'll see. Um, are we going to have various denoiser algorithms? Yeah, well, Denoiser algorithms are so complex that we didn't want to expose all that complexity okay. to users. That's why you don't see denoiser parameters mm -hmm. and the post-processing volume because they are evolving so fast and something that uh, works in 4.22, maybe we'll change that. So internally we have a lot of that, but we are not exposing that to users. So uh, what I can say is that we will just expose things that we are sure that will stay for a while. We don't want to expose uh, 20 parameters of denoises that nobody understands and then remove them in the following version. Right, People you'll update. Very, very confused. What I recommend is that if someone uh, feels strong in terms of denoiser algorithms and they know what they do, they can check the shader code and they can even modify that themselves. That's the beauty of releasing the sources, that yeah. they, they can do that themselves. They can. They can take a look at the denoises. We are. Do we have a major initiative to unify denoises for ray tracing and screen space algorithms now, and that they will see lots of improvements in 4.23 and that space. It's exciting. Yep. Um, in big scenes, is there a global GI scale setting? No, 
There's not. I don't know exactly if th that means that you have some kind of multiplier. No, there's not. The problem we had in big scenes that we are fixing now is that we have a lot of um, precision issues when your wall was very, very large. And we are fixing them now. I, actually, yesterday, uh, one of our engineers, Patrick, did very good progress on, on that regard. So if that has something to do with what this user is asking for, then there will be improvements there in Let's larger see. scale. If you course. have any more details, feel free to hit, um, type them in chat, and I'll see if I can get to it later. Um, will light get some type of LOD? Light? Yeah, I believe lights in general. Uh, there are many ways to understand this question. Uh, if they are asking about a system for understanding which lights are more important for you and which ones have to be discarded and if there is something in the middle that you say, okay, I this light is, is important enough to not discard it, but maybe it's not that it's important as these other ones that are more powerful that are closer to me. Yeah, we are working on on a so like on a, a system for improving that. It's like a concurrency system, similar to what Yeah, it's like a light grid, similar to the light grid injection systems that we have for the raster path, but something three-dimensional and more accurate and in water space, not in camera space. And yeah, we've never used the light LOD exp words for that, but maybe we are talking about the same thing. Or not. I'm sorry, otherwise. <laughs> it's hard. Th that's the question yeah. I received. Um, let's see. Is it possible for an object to have multiple materials in rasterization, but only a single one for ray tracing for better performance? That's something that we have never talked about until a week ago, and suddenly everybody's asking about that. <laughs> yeah. So the answer is that probably. We are looking into that. We need to understand the implications in terms of shader permutations, all the things that can happen. We don't want to, we don't want to make things unnecessarily more complicated. Mm -hmm. But the answer is that Probably. Okay. And probably very soon. Can you do ray tracing on a lower poly version of the map? Don't know if it's beneficial, but have ray tracing of lower polygon version of assets rather than the version you see? Uh, that's a good question. I don't think we expose any parameter for that. You definitely, the ray tracing system has this acceleration structure that you feed it with triangles and nothing blocks you from giving it a s different set of triangles that the ones you're using for raster. So you can send a different LOD. But I don't think we have any C bar for controlling that. Mm -hmm. If they know the code, they could like block, uh, force a certain LOD for geometries. But uh, as I said, typically um, ray tracing, it's not very sensitive to the amount of geometry, so the gains are Unclear, but the gains can be big in some cases. Okay, mm. but in, in the test that I've d in the test that I've done, I couldn't notice much difference. Okay, if you compare polygon counts between meshes, uh, yep. wasn't, it wasn't wasn't yeah. much. So, and that that's good, right? Because that means that your modelers can can do high mm. poly if they want, and they they don't have to worry too much about the performance cost of that on the ray tracing side, right? Yeah, once you have created the the BBIs. The problem sometimes if, if those polys are dynamic and you have to update right. them at every frame, that uh, that can be challenging. To put it in perspective, the reason why that's a technique that sometimes gets done with normal dynamic shadows, non-ray non tracing, that's exactly the picture I had before, right, with the teapots yeah. mm -hmm. comparison, is because when you use normal dynamic shadows, high poly content has a much bigger impact on performance when you trace the shadows from that. Not really trace, but yeah. when you use those for shadow rendering. And with ray tracing, it doesn't do that, so it could actually be faster. Okay. So, um, uh, let's see. Does the, does the engine automatically detect if the user has RTX? Uh, well, yeah, we detect if the um, if you have a ray tracing compatible graphic card, and otherwise, no matter if you have the ray tracing checkbox enabled, you will not have ray tracing. So yeah, it it happens. Uh, there were a couple of bugs in 422 on this detection system, but they should be okay now. There was another huge problem on 422.1 and 2, which was that we had crashes with laptops that had um, non-ray tracing Intel cards mm. and NVIDIA cards at the same time, and our, there was a driver issue. It's a long, long story. But basically, that we, we had to fix that because um, 
you before didn't understand exactly what is going on there. Can individual actors be excluded from ray tracing? Yeah, there is a checkbox. If you select uh, an object, any kind of object in the in the properties panel, you search on the ray tracing, and you can you can exclude them from ray tracing. That's a that's a huge thing that yeah. people use all the time. Visible, Visible ray, ray tracing. tracing. Yeah, if, yeah. Switch, if switch back to the editor for a moment, we can show it over here. So I have the the pillar selected here. Type ray tracing in the in rendering visible in ray tracing. So yeah, that's yep. it. and if I disable that, I should probably presumably yeah disable in the reflection mm -hmm. over here. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good one. Yeah, it's great. And then I think the last one will be just what are your um, they they they're just curious about the future of ray tracing. What are you seeing um, will happen with real time ray tracing in the mm -hmm. in the next couple of years? It's difficult to say because. So many things had happened in the last year, a year and a half, right? Literally, the week before the Star Wars Reflections movie, people f didn't didn't know that ray tracing was going to yeah. be possible for games. And look at where we are now. Mm -hmm. It's not just us; it's, it's everywhere, and people are releasing even games using pad tracing. So, I prefer to stay humble and not try to do like huge predictions. Uh, if my background is in film, in, and in film what happened is that the adoption of ray tracing was kind of tough. It took time, because at the beginning you have all these pipelines, these asset creation, people with this mindset on all the hacks and tricks they had adopted during decades, and it is not that simple to drop all that knowledge and switch to something else. So it took a few years, but when it happened it was not linear. When it happened, three or four years later, uh, probably there's not a single pixel render without ray tracing on films. Mm -hmm. Not a single one. So uh, real-time graphics has different constraints. Will We're going to see uh, raster and ray tracing techniques coexisting, but probably there will be some kind of planning. So at some point in the future, most of the techniques will be ray traced, and you will still use ray tra uh, raster because of other reasons, maybe performance or open wars or places, well, mm -hmm. other kind of problems. I also think that we will tend to use less and less baking mm -hmm. in general. Uh, I think that will be also very good from the workflow side of things. You don't need to pre-compute things. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a costly process. Um, yeah, so the future is it's going to be exciting. Yeah. Um, my background is in film, so sometimes mm -hmm. I think that we will live more or less the same, but at mm -hmm. the same time there are new constraints that yeah. are a bit unpredictable. Definitely we are farther than what I was expecting a year ago. So let's let's formulate this question again in a year. And let's see where we are. We'll, we'll see, yeah. Uh, I'll make sure to yeah. get you back in a year and yeah. then cool. <laughs> repeat the same question. Uh, I did receive two more questions uh, in the end here. We do have time for them. So okay. um, we want to use ray tracing for high resolution static shots. We got issues with the low GPU RAM. Are you planning to have option for sharing the RAM with the CPU? Uh, we know there is a problem uh, doing high resolution captures at h when you push the multiplier to high values. This is not a ray tracing specific problem, but ray tracing uses some extra memory for the noises, so it can it can help this problem to 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 be revealed. Um, but we need to fix that. That's a problem. Uh, I don't think we can make uh, uh, the GPU and CPU memory coexist for that specific case. It has to happen on the GPU. Maybe if you have more than one GPU, we can use that, but it definitely shouldn't crash. We should ca be smart enough to detect when you're running mm -hmm. out of memory and trying to do things in batches or do whatever. Yeah, that's good. Thank you both so much for taking the time to come here and answer all these questions. It's a lot of optimization um, information. Um, and yeah, and this is the first time you're here in the studio, isn't it? It's third time, fourth time. Okay, so I'm just not. <laughs> I, I thought someone mentioned that earlier. It's like, oh, sure, this, this is the first time no, in the no, studio. I, I was even the first guest you ever had oh, really? in, in the live stream in 2014, I think, the first external guest. Cool. So I, have to, I have to go, I have to go back that far and, <laughs> <laughs> and take a look. Yeah, that would be great. Um, okay. I'm sure Chad appreciated it. There was a lot of questions. Uh, obviously, everyone is very excited about um, awesome. ray tracing in the future and 
hopefully we'll start seeing this more and more mm -hmm. in games um, coming out in the cool. in this year and next year as well. Oh, yeah. uh, we will. As always, let us know uh, in the survey that we've linked in chat what you thought about the stream. Um, you have a chance to, you, if you do provide your email with it, we will um, do a little sweepstake and provide you a t-shirt if you're the lucky winner. Um, as always, make sure to check out our user groups. Uh, it's underlin.com user dash groups is the is the link maybe amanda can help me out and uh and, and post it in links you can go check it out it's a great place to share what you're working on get some insights from other developers and sometimes the evangelists like short will come and visit them um yep. and you can get some some expertise and maybe ha hammer short about more ray tracing <laughs> yep. um we always do a, our community spotlights, which is the, the th three ones you see after our new section in the stream. If you are working on something cool that you'd like to share with the world, go ahead and post on our forums in the release section, work in progress, or just straight up send us an email at community at unrealengine.com and we'll take a look and, and see if we might, might get you on there. Um, we also do this countdown video at the start of every stream, which is 30 minutes of content that you'll f uh, fast forward up until five minutes. Go ahead and send us that with your logo, and we will go ahead and put you on as one of our countdown videos. And it's, it's kind of cool to see uh, speed development uh, in that case, sure. and you can learn little tips and tricks just by watching someone do something um, real quick and sped up. If you are streaming on Twitch, make sure that you apply the Unreal Engine category so that we all know and so that developers know around the world that you're streaming on Unre Unreal Engine development um, and so that we can tune in and say hi and maybe even help you out with if you've got some issues. The community is usually very helpful and I frequently see as much the streamer teaching the community as the community teaching the streamer um, right. and helping out with problems and it's interesting to see projects having that sort of very community driven development. Um, and then, as always, follow us on so social media, and big special thanks to all of you in our community. Without you, we wouldn't be doing the live streams. We would not be able to have as many fixes and stuff going in, because I it's all of you breaking our things that makes, us <laughs> makes it possible for us to see where the problems are and that allows us to fix them. So big thanks if you're responding on Answer Hub or the forums and making sure that we're aware of everything that's going on. Um, and with that said, I think it's time to end the stream and make sure you tune in next week because we will be announcing the winners of the Unreal Engine Spring UE4 Jam mm -hmm. that we just had. Uh, it will unfortunately be pre-recorded because both me and Amanda will be at E3, uh, but it should be exciting. I hope you all will, will tune in and we'll make sure to um, tune in and chat and, and answer any questions that you might have during that. And if you're at E3, uh, hit us up on social media and we'll, we can try to try to see you there. Uh, if you see us walking around, make sure you say hi and let us know what you're working on. So without further ado, we're going to say goodbye and hope to yeah. see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.